Good afternoon and welcome to everyone to this expert webinar from ISQI. Um, I'm delighted to have with us today Chris Rourke from User Vision. And the topic we're going to cover is why discovering and designing for your users' tasks is critical for your business success. And Chris will go into a little bit also about why the performance metrics measure, um, matter. A little bit first about ISKI, and I'm going to try to go through this as quickly as possible. We are a global organization. We actually are a group of organizations with um, myself in the UK. We have our International Service Center based in Potsdam near Berlin. We also have an office in the Netherlands and in Boston. We've been around for 15 years now, and this year we're celebrating our 15th anniversary. So watch out for um, some of our social media activity on that. Annually, we certify more than 30,000 professionals in, um, around the world. We have 380 accredited training providers working with us. We have a pool of expertly trained invigilators, around 625 um, around the world, who will actually invigilate um, exam sessions after training. Um, we're also um, delivering via Pearson View, and some of our exams are available in Remote Proctor. Um, we're certifying in about 110 countries in 10 languages. Our portfolio is actually pretty diverse, but if you think about the software development lifecycle, um, I like to think that we have certification exams that cover various parts of that, from requirements through to testing. Um, our usability curriculum is mostly focused around the UXQB, and we have a range of certifications available from the UXQB. I think Chris will just touch on those slightly towards the end of his presentation. If you do want to know more, then um, it's all available on our website, and I'll share some details later. Just to explain the relationship between ISKI and the training provider, and also a qualifications board such as the UXQB, um, ISKI is actually a certification body, and we are certified to the standard ISO 17024. And if you see someone with an ISKI certification, you can be assured that their examination has taken place under the strictest of circumstances and their um, assessment has been validated by an organization that actually works towards the highest standards. Um, the qualifications board, the XQB, we think of as the knowledge generator. They create a syllabus and then we deliver the examinations. The knowledge mediator, the training provider, would be an organization such as User Vision, who would develop training materials and conduct the training. Um, today's session isn't about um, UXQB curriculum specifically. Um, this is content which we hope will be really useful to those of you who are involved in um, UX design. And um, I'm actually going to pass over to Chris now, and he can go on and um, tell you all about this fascinating subject. I've heard his presentation in the last couple of days, and it's a real treat. Passing to you now, Chris. Okay. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, I just want to make sure that my screen is being uh, shown. Okay, show my screen. And um, are you seeing it, Chris? Okay. Okay. Are you seeing the correct screen? Yeah, we're seeing your screen. We just need to see okay. the presentation. Great. Okay. Um, so yes, just to uh, first of all, welcome to everyone that is uh, that has come along today. Uh, thank you very much for for your interest. It's a it's an area that I find fascinating, even though I've been working in the area of user experience for, uh, well, running user vision for over you know, 20 years and working in the field for much longer. Uh, there's some fundamental things that pervade throughout all this time, even though the technology has changed tremendously. There's a core uh, thread throughout all of this, which is you need to stay true and design for the user's tasks. And as I'll present uh, today, it is a bit more challenging than you might think at first uh, at first glance. Um, just to briefly introduce myself and User Vision, uh, it's a company I started about 20 years ago. We're based in Edinburgh, uh, London, and Dubai, and we have hi. a wide range of hi, services. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Yes. Sorry, it's Debbie. We're not seeing your presentation. Can you just click into your PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Is yeah, are you seeing? Okay, are you, are you seeing it now? Are you seeing the, the slides? Um, let's see. 
Okay, are you, are you seeing the, the slide slide set now? We are. If you pop up to slideshow and just run a show, and there we go, it's absolutely spot on. Thank you. Okay, so you're seeing a slide that says, what is a task? Are, are you we, seeing it in prison? Yeah. We're, we're seeing it, it's great, thank you. Okay, um, so yes, we work with a wide range of, of clients uh, that uh, are from various industries, but the common thread is that for whatever the reason is, they are very interested in making sure the customers have a good experience. Sometimes it's a commercial driver, sometimes it's a um, sort of a public sector needing to serve its wide range of customers. Uh, and that's what for me keeps this whole field extremely interesting is the, the wide wide variety of, of the different challenges and the different sectors in which it can be applied, services and UX strategy um, and user research and design and evaluation are some of the core things that we do. Um, and as Debbie has mentioned, we work closely with the UX QB and delivering the um, the certification, the UX certification training from the UX qualification board and ISKI as partners, uh, not only for this webinar, but also in uh, performing the performing the examination uh, phase of that process. So on to what we're talking about today is tasks and uh, why tasks are important is going to be the first thing that I'm going to be talking about. It's something that's inherently there in the background that we always assume we know what um, you know, that we're trying to design well for users' tasks, but uh, it is particularly uh, you know, very important for ensuring a good user experience. And I'll talk about some ways that that can be done in a, in a quite a structured methodology. We call that top task management, um, and that involves task identification and then measuring that task performance. And I'll just give a very quick overview to some of the ways that that, uh, that is done. So first of all, starting off with what is a task? Uh, I think we have a idea in our, our heads what a, a task is is all about, but um, it is not quite as, uh, as straightforward as you might initially think. Um, many tasks uh, are are things that occur to a person at a certain point of time that I suddenly need to be doing this. Uh, typically what a task is all about is really something you need to do to achieve a goal. If, you're, if your goal, for instance, is to have a relaxing holiday, you'll probably have some tasks involving uh, you know, booking a booking a flight or hotels and things such as that. So these are things you need to do to achieve your, your goal. And sometimes they, they do crop up at, uh, at, in, in different ways. You might have a, a goal of, uh, well, basically just getting your point across. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever find yourself in the situation where you suddenly say, well, I, I need to do this. I need to join in on this conversation online on some forum or something. Well, suddenly there you've got a goal to set the world to rights with your very valuable opinion about something, whether it's politics or, or the world in general, uh, and your task is to post a comment uh, on an article or some kind of a forum online. And typically there are lots and lots of subtasks that can be built into that, uh, that you need to be to be doing, such as creating an account on the website, um, choosing your username and password, um, entering the contact details, all, all of these things are needed. They're, they're necessary steps to performing your overall tasks. So tasks are the, uh, a critical component towards what a, a user is wanting to do online. And uh, we'd like to think that they'd be front and center as you're designing the site, but uh, it's not always the case. There's quite a few sort of challenges in in designing uh, around around users' tasks. And I'm gonna present some four important things about tasks. We could call them the, the truisms of tasks, as it were. Um, the first one, one of these is that tasks are actually what matters to your users. Um, and users are, are quite selfish. They don't really care about some of the things that the business might care about, whether that's a commercial business or, or public sector or organization of that type, they really are less interested than you might think about how pretty your homepage is, how much functionality you might have, or how the organization is structured. They just want to very quickly do what they came there to do, whatever this thing that needs to be done in their head. So they may not admire your homepage, they may not really scrutinize your, your navigation options nearly as much as you, you might think. So I know a lot of time and effort could be placed into a, uh, a homepage and design, graphic design, very rich such as that, but it often goes unnoticed or unappreciated uh, because the user just wants to get on with what they're doing. The other thing that uh, the second of these truisms is that it's it's actually quite easy to lose sight of what your user's tasks are. Um, it's There's a lot of noise, there's a lot of thoughts uh, that are 
are being shared in, in the management, the overall management of a website. And it's easy to assume that you know what your users' tasks are and that you're you're helping them by providing lots of links to everything that they could possibly want to do. But that's often not the case. Uh, the best thing is to just let them get on and, and do what they they are primarily there to do. So what often happens in many organizations is that there's a lot of competition to put whatever you want up onto the 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 home page as the typical starting page for for many people when they visit a website. So here we're looking at um, uh, a site that I'm familiar with. You may have guessed by this stage that I'm not uh, not from the UK. I'm from uh, I'm the United States originally, and I have a certain relationship with this organization called the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, they're the people who collect taxes, amongst other things. And you can have a look at their, their homepage and see that there's a lot going on there. There's a lot of navigation options that they were presenting. We have things on filing and payments and credits and deductions and forms and pubs, help and resources and for tax pros. Um, and fortunately, it seems like it's a pretty enjoyable experience, whatever they do, this thing is to do with taxes. There's a lot of happy faces on there. And we can see some of those uh, the things that they're inviting you to do, filing your taxes and getting refunds, et cetera. And then we see, again, a lot of detail on forms and pubs and lots of codes uh, for, for these different uh, forms, the 1040 and all of these other variations of it. And then what are hot topics, which are hot topics um, uh, about all sorts of things to do with, uh, with what their finding is, yeah, these are what we think are very hot topics. Um, they have tools. And they also have lots of logos for know, partner organizations or software. They also have news and they also have unclaimed refunds. And probably most importantly to, to any visitor is that they have social media and they make videos as well. So all of that has found a place on this, this homepage. Relatively little of that is truly related to what the user's tasks are. Uh, a lot more is down to the sort of the granular level. And a lot of these things have arrived on there not really through the demands of the end user, but more through the internal conversations that typically happen um, in in an organization. Um, so they went through a process that I'll I'll talk about shortly about top tasks identification and trying to um, trying to refine that and really base it around what the user's tasks are. And this was the initial redesign that they came up with, which you might think, well, it can't be nearly as good because I don't see any of these happy faces. But I can guarantee you there was a lot more happy faces from people that are having to engage with their taxes because of this. Um, they pared it back down to what are the core tasks that people are trying to do and made those as clear as possible, the links uh, that are most apparent to them. Um, and as a result of that, there was much greater engagement with doing those tasks online and conversely, much less having to go through other channels. And for many organizations, financial, public sector, and others, this is a key challenge. How do we let people self-serve on that uh, on that site? They've refined that over time. It's become a bit better to, um, you know, getting your, getting your refund status and, uh, you know, reviewing your account and all of these things, they've they've changed a few of them, changed the wording of them, but this is essentially the same approach, and it's working so much better uh, for them to to maintain that organizational efficiency and also allowing the user to do what they came to do by reducing the amount of noise uh, that is on that. So, trying to keep it true to what the users want is actually a bit more challenging than you might you might actually think. A third sort of truism about tasks is that it's sometimes hard to manage them over time. Um, there's there's lots of internal pressures that will determine the content and the navigation of your of your site. And a lot of these are related or you know what happens there is not necessarily related to the, the tasks of the end user. Even if you happen to have started off with the perfect site, maybe you've done a lot of uh, traditional information architecture methods such as card sorting or tree testing, and you've got a good handle on you know, how to best organize the content and label it on your site. Well, reality happens and some things start to change. You'll find that there could be pressures to promote key topics. You might have certain new, certain managers that say, I, I demand a quarter of the homepage for this, this area that I've got a, uh, you know, a personal KPI against. Uh, there's a lot of pressure to add more topics. And you can imagine this with some of that IRS uh, website. A lot of the content that ended up there were 
we're probably were preceded with a conversation. Hey, we've got some new new videos in, in social media. Can we put something on the homepage about that? Or, um, you know, I've got a new article about about this topic. Let's put something else on there. So there's a lot of pressure to add new topics or actually add more pressure, add more content about topics that are already there. Um, so as a result, there's more and more and more put up online and actually relatively little of this being done, uh, removing the old topics. And this is something I'll come back to a bit later on, but that's where often the best value can be delivered is to actually remove some of those old topics uh, and actually refine it down to around what the, what the user is actually trying to do. The fourth and, and final sort of truism about tasks is that measuring task success is actually rather hard. Um, it's much easier to measure your own content than the actual the user experience of what's what how are people getting on with doing these tasks on their site. Uh, we have a we have a more immediate uh, uh, connection towards what is. Um, what is uh, happening on your site in terms of maybe the number of pages you have up there or the amount of traffic they're getting. So that's all available using Google Analytics or whatever. That's that's relatively uh, easy to, to measure. What's harder to measure is how, how well is that serving for users finding the information, doing what they want to do, and serving them in the end-to-end -end task that they're trying to do. Um, so many there's a lot of talk about sort of content management. Uh, that's, that's sort of... A, uh, a topic of conversation in many sort of web teams or, or digital teams. There's relatively little conversation, I'd say, compared uh, to that about task management because you can have a conversation with yourself or colleagues and and recognize that wow, well now we've got 20% more pages on the site than we did a few months ago. That's that's great. I can see that we've got more pages. We've been really ramping up the content. That's that someone's told me that's bound to be good for our search engine optimization. I, I can't see why it wouldn't. So that's great. We're doing we're doing well because we can measure the number of pages on there. Or you could even look at the analytics and say, oh, look at this. We're getting a lot more sort of engagement. People are going through our pages a lot more. They're clicking through all of these pages a lot more. That's that's bound to be a good thing. Well, perhaps not. Um, the analytics can tell you tell you a story that can be often interpreted in a couple of uh, quite a few different ways. Um, what you may find, and we've certainly seen this with uh, various client projects, is that the greater wandering around on a website is not necessarily related to a strong engagement, but more they're perhaps a little bit lost in their searching everywhere to find what they're looking for uh, before they finally give up. So. Anything interpreted purely through the Google Analytics needs to be interpreted very carefully. I sometimes say that uh, GA is, is a bit like, interpreting that is a bit like reading tea leaves. You can see how many people are there, where they came from, how much time they spent on the site, and what they actually did. But what you are always left with this bit of a nagging question is, did they actually do what they came here to do? And that nagging question is really comes back to the the, the central thing that we're going to be talking about because that doing what they came there to do brings us back to our topic of of the tasks. So what we want to do is me focus on as much as possible measuring customer outcomes um, over business outputs. Business outputs are relatively easy to measure in a lot of cases. How many things such as the number of pages? Customer outcomes are a lot harder to do in a systematic and controlled way, which we're going to be talking about. So as I as I've mentioned in the earlier slides, it's it's quite easy to to put things online, and, and as I've seen on on many kinds of projects, lots of sites are managed slightly as a dumping ground. Oh, we've got some new content. It's easy to publish the content. Let's just stick it up online. I'm not sure where to put it. Let's let's just put it right there. And it is quite dangerous to produce the content without really understanding what is the tasks behind it. In an ideal world, every bit of new content or functionality should be able to be mapped onto Right, what is the user task? What's their task and their goal that this content is going to be helping with? Hopefully that should align with what the what the business goal is as well. Um, but it's much easier to add the content than to remove it. And every time you do that, you're effectively making the haystack a lot bigger or, um, within which someone is trying to find their needle. And that can be a real problem. And that problem has been recognized by organizations such as uh, gov.uk, um, I've seen, this quote um, from them on, I, I think, certain blogs, or it's probably up on a, 
a mural on a wall somewhere with them is that every superfluous page we create is one more dead end for an angry, frustrated, confused user. And I think that's a great um, mantra to, to live with because it gives you a pause to think, right, is what we're putting up really uh, necessary? And is it in an in a amount of content that is going to be relevant for the tasks? Um, if not, let's really think about whether or not we actually want to be putting it up online. So hopefully you can you can appreciate that there is a, a challenge in trying to ensure that you, anything that you put online is is relevant to the tasks and it's not as easy to to actually determine what these tasks are as you might think. The good news is that we have ways of of investigating this this problem space. Uh, we call it top task management, um, and that's what I'm going to be covering really for the for the rest of this uh, this presentation. Um, and we'll talk about uh, how you can actually do that with identifying and then checking yourself on the performance of those tasks over time. Now, at this stage, some of you might be familiar with the world of top task management. And if you are, it's due to um, this, this man, Jerry McGovern, who's the sort of inventor of the top tasks method. Um, he's been doing that for, well, many years, at least 20 years. It's a um, yeah, from its formations in information architecture, really focusing in on this concept of tasks and really making sure that everyone has a clear idea what their tasks are and designing for those. So uh, Jerry's done a lot of uh, a lot of books about this. His most recent one is about a how-to guide on top tasks. It's highly recommended. His company, Customer Care Words, uh, was really uh, developed it, and he's got a, a great weekly blog about that as well. So we're fortunate in being able to work with Jerry uh, on this um, about refining the methods and uh, and uh, working with Jerry on the analysis of the of the uh, the results when when projects are are conducted. So uh, the top task management approach has a few different um, a few different components. Um, but before I go into those, let's just think through what do I mean by top tasks? I've given a definition of tasks, but what exactly are top tasks? Well, every site has some of the key tasks that that deliver a huge amount of value. Uh, these are these are the top tasks. Um, you can look at that using the framework of the um, of, of the long tail. You've, you you might be familiar with that. It's used in marketing and search engine search engine optimization, etc., for the keywords. And it's a, it's a very interesting concept um, about really the the, the benefit that. The, the web, for instance, can can provide allowing people to find really niche niche topics or niche niche uh, products, etc. So every site has its top tasks, and those are the ones that are very popular. That's a many many people want to perform those tasks, um, and they exist in what we can call the the long neck of this of this diagram. But every every site also has many what we'll call tiny tasks. These are tasks that can also deliver value because one of the great things about the web is that it allows people to find their, you know, to satisfy their own niche little tasks, whatever they might be. But it's getting those in balance that's that's important. So they can deliver great value, but they also have the potential to destroy value if they get in the way of the top tasks. So uh, that that is a, a key challenge that we're going to bear in mind here. And our goal is to manage the top tasks and stop thinking about so much managing the content or managing the technology. There's a lot of conversations that typically happen in many um, many organizations and many projects where the shiny new technology or uh, you know, this, this wonderful new volume of content that you've been given becomes the, the, the focus. And so we have to, let's deal with this content or let's, what can we do to really make the most of this new technology? Those are interesting conversations to be had, but at times they can get in the way and be distractions from the real, the real focus, which is, are we doing the things that are gonna let people perform their tasks? So you wanna focus on helping your customers to complete their top tasks as quickly and as easily as possible. So we call this the, the top task management process, um, and there's two main phases to it. Uh, there's identifying the top tasks, and this is, really a, um, a statistically reliable method to, to find out what is it that people are wanting to do on our site. There'll be a lot of internal opinions, your own opinion amongst others, but what we want to do is have some credible um, information about what it is that people want to do. And you might find that it differs from what the internal view is of uh, what people uh, want to 
want to do on the site. Um, and then once you have a good handle on that, you might need to make some changes to your site to reflect that. And then measure the performance. Uh, over time, how well are people able to succeed and can they do it quickly, these tasks? Because that's a key part to that. And just uh, looking at that on a repeated basis and continuously improving. So what I'd like to do is start off with the, the top task identification method, uh, which is really the, the original method to, to start to align the uh, a, a website, for instance, around people's uh, top tasks. Now, what this image here uh, is, is to try and give an overview of what the top task identification process is. It's a, uh, it's a process that does take time to really properly explain. I'm going to give you a very brief uh, introduction right now, but uh, there's a lot more that I uh, can tell you about another time. We give training courses about uh, how to perform top tasks. But the first step in this four-part four part process I'm going to talk about is going to be coming up with what we'll call a long list. This is casting your net very widely. What are all the things that someone could do on our site or on our app? Uh, let's imagine that it's a website for the moment. Uh, you can look to lots of sources to do that, get a lot of internal views. You can even look to competitors and various surveys. And you want to think through what are all the things that could be done there. And then you need to refine that. And I'm going to talk about this process very briefly about shortlisting. And then once you do that, you have a short list of tasks that are relevant and are well phrased that can be shown to the to the actual users and presented to them in a way that they can choose what are their top tasks. They'll recognize those, they'll resonate with them and say, yep, those are some of my top tasks. So it goes on to that stage. And from that, you can learn a lot about what are the most important tasks to the different types of users and use that information to your advantage to refine typically the things that get changed is looking at the content that's on the site, the navigation, that's part of the, the information architecture, and coming up with a, a better way to present the information on, on the site that aligns with the, 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 uh, the tasks of the end users. So looking very briefly at that first one, it's casting that net widely into sources of the, of the long lists. We're creating a long list of tasks, and that long list, it could be hundreds of, uh, of items. Um, this is from looking at your search results. It could be looking at your competitors. It could be lots of other sources with people basically listing what are the things that one could do on this site. You can look at your Google Analytics and find out which are the most popular tasks and uh, most popular pages, and from that determine, well, what seem to be the, the tasks that are related to those pages? So this is the initial stage of casting the net very widely. Um, and actually, social media is another good one as well. Of what are people expecting to be able to do on this on this site? Um, so this is uh, just showing an image of of the hundreds. It could go on for quite a long time of all the different things that you could do on a, on a site. Uh, in this case, a public sector site related to a, a parliament. Um, all of that information needs to be refined, and we call this shortlisting. And shortlisting is is the critical and perhaps I'd say the most challenging and the most difficult part of, of this uh, because a lot of decisions need to be made to refine that very long list into one that's more manageable. Uh, typically, the way that this is done is through a series of, of workshops. This is the, the recommended way to do it. Uh, the number of workshops, it's typically four, five, six, maybe even a bit more workshops, up to around two hours. And there's participants in the workshops around uh, somewhere between four and eight people who attend these workshops and go through that list that I showed you before of all the of the tasks and try to see where there could be duplications, how they could be reworded, um, so that uh, we start to work towards a shorter list. As I said, this is the the critical part to the uh, to the top tasks identification process. Um, you have to follow very specific rules about how to refine that longer list into a shorter one, uh, looking out for duplicates or certain jargon um, and very audience specific jargon, things such as that. And it does involve using a, a spreadsheet that's uh, it's managed over time where everyone's talking through what are these what are these uh, topics or what are these tasks that someone could do on the site and where did we find them originally? What's the source of them? And um, this is the kind of thing that uh, is, is critical at this stage. Uh, you can also take that opportunity to start thinking through what we want to learn about our users as well. Who are the people that are coming to the site? And of course, different users will have different um, 
uh, have different needs. Uh, and you try and ask yourself, what kind of questions, we call them category questions, you might want to, to know about your users. You know, it could be where they're from or their professional role, their, you know, even things to, to the industry the, that they're in, et cetera. So coming up with a few of these category questions will allow you to slice and dice your data, as you'll see. And then comes the, the very important part of actually voting for the tasks. Uh, it could be called a poll or a survey, but it's a way of showing these this short list of tasks to the users and asking them to, to really go on their instincts and choose which are the, the, the most important ones to them. Um, and it's framed in a question such as, you know, in dealing with your health, which of these is the most important uh, tasks or words to that effect, when buying a car, when choosing university, whatever the matter at hand is, whatever the purpose, the general purpose of that site is. And this is presented in a very interesting way. It's a very long list of what the tasks could be. It's one single column. It can be looked at online, at a desktop or mobile, and it's a long scrolling page. And it seems a bit mad, but this works really well because we know it's been done on hundreds of projects. It's a randomized list, which is very important. So there's no order effect. Every single person who does this will be getting a different order of these, of these tasks. So that, uh, that really helps. Then they can choose the, typically we'll make it up to five, uh, five of the most, most important tasks to them. And doing this over and over again with at least 400 people. So you can get a statistically valid and, and powerful uh, result out of this as well. And it can be deployed in various ways. It could be a website pop-up or an invitation out to, to website to customer lists, et cetera. Um, and so you could have a start of the, the survey, something like that, and looking at the following uh, list of, you know, the list of tasks really, choose the top five for why you come to the OECD, which is a very big international uh, organization uh, that does various, uh, various services. And that is a very long list. It goes on and on and on. And there is dozens and dozens of tasks. Typically, it's less than 100. It's, that's, that's what we usually set as the maximum, but usually it's around 50 to 80 or so tasks. Having done that with that many people, there'll be certain tasks that keep getting chosen again and again and again. Uh, not everyone, but many people will keep saying, yep, that, that task is, that's the main reason why I come here. And that's really the crux of the analysis of these results. There's a lot of information that comes out of it. Typically, the most important one is which tasks are most important. And you can start to think through, are there differences between the different subgroups? We'll see that in just a minute. And you can compare your results, what seem to be the most important tasks, to the tasks that are that are serviced on your on your website or supported on your website through the functionality and content that you're providing. And you can do a form of a gap analysis really between what people are seeming to want through the survey and what you're actually offering. And that's really the crux of the matter. Where should we allocate more resources? Is our content right for this? Actually, could there be a chance to remove some of the content? Um, are there areas that deserve higher prominence? You know, we didn't realize that people had wanted to perform certain tasks as much as they did. Um, <clears throat> so looking, for instance, at this OECD one, uh, when uh, well, Jerry and his team did this project, it was one where uh, they found that there were four tasks that garnered 25% of the, of the uh, choosing of the, of the tasks. These are what we're gonna call the top tasks. So the main uh, outcome from it is a giant pie chart and in this case you can see we've used a bit of color coding to to indicate the top tasks medium small and, and tiny tasks um, and indeed that top task which in this case is learning about country surveys reviews and reports got as many votes as the bottom 28 tasks and that's useful to to know on its own but if, now that we know what the top four tasks are we can Look at look at the the content and the presentation on the site to to really have a critical eye of it. Uh, often, what you'll find is that a lot of effort is being put into promoting some of these tiny tasks. Uh, we've often found that there's a lot of internal angst over the fact that no one's really engaging with these tiny tasks. What should we do about that? I know. Let's um let's let's try and promote it. Let's give it some you know some space on the homepage. Let's let's uh, you know really raise it up in the hierarchy. And this kind of goes against the, uh, the overall approach that we're trying to support of promoting and letting people perform those top tasks as the primary thing and not let those tiny tasks get in the way. 
The other thing that we did is take a close look at who are the users and are there differences between them? Will there be different top tasks depending on the type of the type of user? And indeed, on just about every project, there is you know, some interesting differences between the uh, the different types of users. So uh, what we can do is those category questions that uh, I mentioned, we can use those to our advantage and see what kind of tasks are wanted by different types of, of users once you've captured the, the kind of users that they are. So there are uh, in this in this case here, it's from a different a different project. This is from a, a business information site called uh, Business Link, um, where on that right hand column we can see what the top tasks were, um, and that's that's great. You can see those. In that case, there were five top tasks that uh, were in that in that initial quartile. But if you start to look at the different user types. If you're anything in starting a business, your needs are going to be a bit different than if you're in the middle column there, which is employing staff. If you've got a team of many people, it could be just a few dozen or it could be hundreds. And that, again, is going to be different if you're a self-employed person. So when you're starting a business, your top tasks might differ from what the overall average is there. Even though managing people is indeed a top task across, um, you know, in, in general, when you're starting a business, that's probably not your, your one of your, your core things. There's a lot to be thinking about when you're starting a business. Managing people is actually relatively a tiny task for those people that were business starters, as it were. Um, at a later stage, if you're employing staff, you've got lots of people, you're responsible for them, you need to really start thinking seriously about health and safety at work. Um, so that, that becomes actually a very important top task uh, for people that are employing staff. But uh, perhaps a bit less so for, for the average, you know, in, in context of all the other tasks. So who you are and the type of person that you are will be a big determinant on that, on that task as well. Again, that can be used very much to your advantage to uh, refine the content and the functionality that's provided on the site. So it's only those that are supporting the, those tasks. Once you know a little bit about what they're, the goals of the, of the visitor of the site is, whether it's starting a business or uh, if they're employing staff, whatever. So just to give you a quick example of this, and this is uh, from a, a public sector, it's uh, Liverpool City Council. Um, it's it's one that uh, uh, I think really shows something that we see on, on a lot of projects, that um, often there's a lot of heady discussion and arguments perhaps about what content deserves to be on the on the homepage on the site or as part of the primary navigation. And at this, at this stage, it was a rather fragmented navigation. Um, what they found from looking at that initial homepage is that, uh, yeah, th there was a, not a lot of engagement on the site, not as much as they needed, and uh, people were choosing other channels. They were going to the phones, they were they were visiting the, uh, you know, the, the, the offices, um, and so much could be done online, but it was a bit not in line with the top tasks, which they found through the through the research method I just described, were really things to do with libraries, roads, leisure facilities, things such as this. They may not be the most exciting thing that the the council perhaps is interested in promoting. They might have they want, might want to be talking about other things, but that was the things that the users were wanting. And what they found is that a lot of the activity, the publishing activity from the organization, was going towards things that were not really so much in demand by the users. They were often the things that were the tiny tasks that often reflected sort of the ego of the organization. Uh, could be senior management profiles or speeches and things such as that. So a major alignment exercise was done, and what they found was that there was a lot of opportunities to 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 make appropriate changes. And the the uh, the current website um, is is really reflecting that. It is uh, what they found is that they could get a lot of benefit from removing a lot of the um, of the content. That's making that haystack a lot smaller. Um, they've reduced the number of pages on the site from what was 4,000 down to 700. Uh, there was a lot of redundant stuff that wasn't needed there, wasn't really supporting any particular task that was in demand. So they made a brave move and said, actually, let's just remove some of that stuff and see how people get on. And what they found is that re the reduced content actually helped people find what they were looking to do a lot more easily. There was a large reduction in support calls, as in calling to the alternative to this channel, which is going to the call center, um, that was reduced, which is for any organization a, a great benefit. 
and they had a 400% increase in the amount of people doing the online transactions, whether that's reporting or paying online, because they made that uh, navigation based on the top tasks so much more clear uh, in this case. So that's that's why that uh, has been redesigned in that in that uh, format. So that's the world of identifying the tasks and then using that information to really critically look at what's being provided on online and making the appropriate changes. A lot of things can be done in the world of, we typically call that information architecture. That could be doing some card sorting and tree testing to actually refine these things and make intelligent decisions about what content should stay, uh, what should be removed, uh, and continuously going back to that North Star of, you know, what is it that users are wanting to do on our site? Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is ways that you can track this over time. If, if we think that we've actually made the website a bit better and more aligned with people's tasks, uh, that's good, but it's not a one-stop shop. We have to make sure that it's continuously getting better over over time. Uh, there's a couple couple main ways that I want to introduce here as as ways to raise your awareness or you know overtly check what are how are people getting on with actually performing these tasks. So. One of those is to do what uh, we call a task performance indicator um, uh, exercise. Uh, you want to repeatedly measure the task performance uh, and come up with evidence that you can discuss with the other stakeholders in your organization about the performance of the website or the app. So measuring the task performance is, uh, uh, or TPI for short, is, uh, is the key method for doing that. It's a um, very specific exercise. It's somewhat related to doing a remote moderated usability test. If any of you are familiar with doing that, um, it's a very you know, effective way to reach your audience and in a very cost-effective way, run some usability testing. Um, it's, it's related to that, but it's not exactly the same. There's a certain protocol that we follow that's, that's, that's it's a bit different. And it's also done with a bit more than is typically used in a usability test, typically up to around 20 users, um, very much looking at the time that they're taking to perform the tasks and giving them very specific instructions as their as their task scenario and seeing seeing whether they succeeded and uh, what their time was on doing that and carefully measuring the task success the time and observing their behavior in an even closer way than it is typically done in usability testing and doing that on a repeated basis because that way you can get the benchmarking uh, in the benchmarking, you might find that your your performance is quite high, and this ha actually happened with one uh, with one organization looking at a great high success, and then some new content came along or a new functionality put on on the website that actually reduced the the success rate. It got in the way, or it it, it stopped people from being able to perform their tasks as as well. Uh, these some of these top tasks, and then they they noticed that due to the the lower success rate, and were able to make the changes. That's the kind of thing that we want to be achieving. We want to be making the task performance a measurable management metric, and that's exactly what this allows you to do through the benchmarking. Another very effective way to do that is to to perform a, a method we call a true intent study. Um, true intent study is looking at really the, the traffic that's coming to your site, the people that are coming to your site and performing their tasks. That's, uh, that's happening as we speak on, on every site that's out there. People are trying to do things, find things, buy things, whatever it might be. And that information can be captured and analyzed. We'll all be familiar with you know, Google Analytics, as I mentioned, and there's other tools available to, to actually understand where they're coming from, what pages are they going to, where do they, you know, what's the order of pages, and that's all useful, but it's not really talking about the tasks per se. It's really people giving evidence of what they're trying to do. It's giving you clues, but it's not actually ask, It's not actually showing you clearly, here's the task, here's what people are trying to do. Um, and also, the other big unanswered question is, how did they get on with doing it? Just because they went to a certain page doesn't necessarily mean that it, they've performed a certain task. So the process is that you learn from the large volumes of, of traffic that could be coming to your site. You measure the popularity of those tasks, which are the ones that are, people are wanting to do. And then you repeat that on a, on a regular basis for benchmarking and see if certain tasks are coming online um, now and you can, you can adapt yourselves and your content uh, as appropriate. So you start off with a very simple initial question when someone comes to the site. It can be through a, uh, through a, a pop-up type approach where it says, Okay, what is the what is the purpose of your visit? Why are you here today? Whatever form of words you want to use, 
and you can offer them a sort of a menu of, of typical options. You can give them another as well, uh, an other option as well. And uh, you let them choose. Well, I'm actually here to uh, to really look into the accreditation of you know the schools and programs. Some of these things could be informed by that top task ID process I just mentioned before. But what you've done is captured why they're there. They sort of declared why they're there. That's why we call it a true intent study. And once they've done that, you just let them perform that task. And at the end, they can recall this and say, and, you, and, and answer the question, did you actually complete what you came here for? And that's where you can find out, yes, I did, or no, I didn't. And if they didn't, you can start to learn a bit more about why they didn't uh, achieve their, their task. And all of this is real gold dust for continuous improvement of your website. You can represent it on a, on a dashboard such as this. It's a task analytics uh, dashboard where you can actually look at the, uh, the the tasks and have a critical eye to to see which are the most important tasks or the most popular tasks and how well are people getting on with doing that so um, there on the on that list of tasks there uh, this is just showing some sample data rather than any any real data but uh, it's in this example here becoming a customer is actually the the highest demand or the most popular tasks. Um, that was 57.1 from over a thousand responses. So it rank orders them by by demand, and that's interesting to know. But what's also interesting to know is that in this case, becoming a customer has a relatively low completion rate uh, of less than 50% in that case. So that really helps to identify where should we apply our resources? Where are the where's the squeaky wheels in this in this whole machine of our website that we need to be trying to improve? So you can focus in on those that are, are causing the most problems. And as we'll see, there's ways that you can slice and dice and filter this so that you can even further refine what you're actually, um, what you're looking at. So the uh, looking at the task demand and the success in this case here, um, you know, how much data do I have left could be the, a, a key task uh, that is people, that the people are, um, that people are interested in performing. And, um, and there's relatively high success in the performance of that, uh, as opposed to changing the plan of a telecoms provider, let's say, uh, has much lower success rate. And that really helps to refine the resources that you can apply. Um, there's many, many organizations will have the idea of usability and user experience and trying to improve it, but where you actually focus your efforts is often not, uh, not as well defined. So you can also look at you know, if they didn't succeed, why they didn't. Uh, and you can give options on that, uh, whether they couldn't find what they're looking for, uh, not enough information. And then a very important one that will definitely go unanswered in something like Google Analytics, which is what will they do instead? Um, you know, is it gonna be contacting them through social media, through the phones, try a competitor? There's lots of options out there. So all of this gives you much further evidence of, 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 the, of what people are trying to do. It, it does actually integrate with Google Analytics and tools such as uh, Hotjar so that you can actually really get a better idea of who the users are that are taking part in this and uh, what, what is their path through the site as they're trying to perform these tasks. And I think very interestingly, you can filter and compare to find out what's the most relevant data. You can compare the desktop performance of the task versus the, um, versus the, uh, the mobile or you could say, how are people in France performing this task as opposed to um, as opposed to the UK or Germany or wherever? So comparing all of these different uh, regions, uh, platforms, you could compare the month of June to the month of July, whatever it whatever it might be, and that allows you to further drill down and and see where the real nature of your of your problems are. So we've learned about why tasks are important. And very important, we've learned about how that can be managed so that you can actually use this to your advantage. Um, the benefits of managing your top tasks is that it overall provides a better customer experience. Uh, users can do the things that are most important to them. They can do that more quickly and easily. Um, and those tiny tasks aren't really getting in the way, uh, or at least there's a much less chance that that will be the case. You can prioritize your development efforts to be aligned with these user needs. And that's that's an important aspect to, to remember. Uh, as I mentioned with that Liverpool example, there was a, in that case, there was a lot of effort being put into uh, trying to promote in some way, trying to 
republish and promote certain tasks that they thought were important um, as well. So keeping your keeping your focus aligned to what are the top task users is, is a key benefit to this. And you produce the appropriate content and remove the redundant content based on, on this evidence. Uh, it might sound controversial to be removing content, uh, you, know, you can imagine someone saying, yeah, well, this week I've published 50 pages, that's gonna be great for the website and great for me, um, as opposed to someone you know, removing 50 pages from a website. But very often by making that haystack smaller, it's serving a much better purpose. Uh, and if you can be doing that removal of redundant content or unnecessary content based on evidence, then there's going to be less, uh, less discussion and controversy over that. Um, you have better self-service by the customers. So whether that you're trying to drive people to self-serve through the website or an app, uh, rather than going through the phones or intermediaries, that's that's fine, that can be done. Uh, it gives you much greater efficiency for your organization as well. Uh, and that's that's typically a goal for all of this. And it gives you improved search results by having the right content for people's tasks. That is going to be better for not only your sort of internal management of your own content, but in the recognition from from search engines as well, people are people. Search engines reward tasks uh, sites that allow people to perform their tasks uh, because people will come back to those. So it has several benefits, both on the individual and the organization level. So that's all I wanted to to say with a presentation like this. I hope it's it's giving you some information and hopefully giving you a few questions, which I'd be glad to to talk through as well uh, as part of this. Um, I believe these. Uh, slides or the, the link to this, pres this presentation can be shared. Um, and I'll just wrap up by mentioning the, uh, going back to what Debbie was saying there at the beginning with uh, the relationship with ISCI and, and the UX Qualification Board. Um, the, the training that, that she mentioned is, uh, we call it the Certified Professional for Usability and User Experience or CPUX uh, for, for short. And um, the most popular of those courses is, is the initial course. We call it the foundation training. Um, it's, a, it's a great course all about the human-centered design process, which is that image that you're seeing right there. It's, that's a little snippet from the, sort of the, the core process that is discussed during this training. It's all about how we discover the, the user needs through sort of contextual analysis and, and other methods and interviews, and then use that to, to, to specify what the user requirements, what are the sort of the attributes of the solution to really meet those needs, designing that through carefully prototyping and following best practice guidelines for usability and user experience and evaluating it through usability testing or, or other relevant methods. So all of that's covered in the CPUX training, and that is the human-centered design process. And we've got a series of, of courses coming up. Uh, the next three courses are in uh, both Edinburgh and London on those dates that are shown there. And as a little thank you for attending the, the webinar today, we'd be glad to offer a, a discount code. It could be, it says ISKI10, and you can use that if you'd like to register for the, the training at, uh, at UserVision, and that's the, the, the URL right there, uh, uservision.co.uk forward slash training. So more information about those courses is there. And I'd be more than happy to tell you some more information about the uh, the top tasks method or the the importance of designing for tasks if if you wish. I think at this stage, Debbie, I don't know if you need to do anything to, you know, if you've had any questions uh, or anything like that, but I'd be glad to discuss those a bit a bit more. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much. That was great insight into task analysis and um, things such as true intent I found totally fascinating. Um, I think you certainly touched a chord uh, with a few of us when you talked about um, the customer wanting to become a customer and then why did they drop out, things like that, a lot to think about. Um, mm -hmm. Question from me, um, It's you, you talked about the internal angst perhaps about the, the tiny tasks and I think it's an interesting juxtaposition between the internal perception of what the customers or the users are wanting to do on the, the website, as an example, versus the reality of what the customers were trying to do. Um, mm -hmm. how, do you buy, how do you achieve buy-in from the business users who think they know better? Well, I think it's asking them to be honest with themselves and ask a very simple but could be a daunting question, uh, which is, what are your users wanting to do on the site? And they'll come up with a few opinions and you can ask why and how do you know that? And very often the answer will be, 
um, well, I can look at our analytics and I can see that lots of people are going to these pages or I'm looking in our search engines uh, and that's what uh, people are seeming to be searching for. But you can quickly pick that apart and say, well, just because people are, you know, are, are searching for it, that's not always the, the clearest um, the clearest view of what what the tasks are that are people wanting to do. There's a lot of um, what we might call unknown unknowns. Um, things like yeah, putting a putting a query into the search engine does kind of reveal your hand of what you're trying to do. But for all those other people that that are just browsing around the site, you never really find out what they're trying to do. You're having to speculate based on the order of pages that they're going to or the page that they finally get to and drop out. You don't know if they've dropped out having satisfied their task or not. Um, the other thing that we can do, and I didn't have time because this is very, very much the tip of the iceberg to the process. As I said, we have a whole sort of separate one day training course about uh, top task analysis, um, is to do what we call an empathy, empathy uh, analysis, where that selecting the top tasks um, that is done by the end users, over 400 of them, uh, can be replicated internally, asking the internal team, the stakeholders, whatever you might want to call them, um, what do you think are the top tasks that users are wanting to do? And you'll get a much smaller number than 400, but still enough people to be answering that of the stakeholders. Well, these are the things that we think they're wanting to do. And then you can do a very interesting sort of gap analysis. We call this the empathy analysis, where you compare what are the top tasks that were rated by the end users, and what are the top tasks that were you know, perceived or assumed, presumed by the, the organization itself. And there's often some very interesting gaps between those. Sometimes there's good alignment and everyone can be very proud of that, but there's a lot of times where you're, you're getting a bit of a blind side to say, oh, I didn't realize there was so much that users were wanting to do. We thought, we thought this would be one of their, their key tasks. And this angst often comes from the organization trying to promote what they think are the top tasks. And now we're just having a more intelligent conversation based on the evidence we're getting from the end users. Fabulous, Chris. Um, a question here, um, does this process work for any UI design, not just websites? Yes, it does. Um, it's particularly relevant for websites and especially large websites. So it's often um, sort of government or university sites, things where there's a lot of many, many different types of tasks you can do. Um, that are, that are available uh, and there's often some internal disagreement about what those tasks are. Yes, it does inform the UI design of software. It should be something that is done in the, uh, the creation of, of apps and software as well. Many times apps such as those that you have on your phone will have a lot more, a, a tighter list of, of tasks that they're trying to do. Many apps are just purely there for, for one core task of you know finding the news or listening to a podcast, whatever it might be. So. Um, I'd say things such as general uh, general information finding, which is availed by uh, websites, is, uh, is is I'd say the core area for this, but it can also be applied towards other types of interface design as, as well. The thing that you probably have noticed that none of this is actually talking about the interface design per se. There's none of this is saying, okay, you want to put this kind of information in the top left or you know you want to color it you know red or anything like that that's that's a whole separate graphic design and visual design that's a whole separate thing very important but it needs to be that is there to enhance the core thing of the the tasks and the the underpinning uh content and functionality for supporting those tasks so back to the question yes it can be applied to more widely than just websites itself um, Chris, another question here from Stephen. Um, question um, stroke um, observation. The use of task management question. We have small tools with UI that we struggle to know what our users used for. That's their top tasks. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Um, sorry, could you re rephrase the question, please? Stephen says, the use of task management. We have mm -hmm. small tools with UI that we struggle to know what our users used for, our, our mm -hmm. users use okay. them for. Yeah. What's their top tasks? Yeah, well, th that is, uh, if you have a, a vehicle, a way to, to, to try and find out what it is, the tasks that the users are trying to do, that's the best way. To, to, to find that. Um, I've talked about the top tasks method and how that's actually deployed. Typically on a website, it could be through a pop-up. Uh, there are other ways you can actually put it out to a survey to them and ask them what are these, what are these uh, key tasks that they're trying to perform. And then sort of analyze 
what you're offering for functionality and therefore the tasks to what they're actually trying to do. There's other ways within our wonderful large you know, kit bag of, uh, of methods and tools in the, in the world of user experience and user research, there's some other ways that you might want to consider as well. Those could be going out to actually visit the users, having some interviews, doing some observations. Uh, that's a key part to it as well. You can give it a fancy name of uh, ethnography and, and actually just watching what is it that the user is trying to do, not so much in the use of your interface per se, but in trying to perform that overall task because there's a lot of things that could be impacting that. It could be the context of use. There's the environment. Um, and you can learn a lot just by observing users. So yes, you can apply the top tasks method and that polling method that I talked about, um, but other ways as well. It's, uh, yeah, to, to, to really find that out. But I encourage you to do that. It's a, it's a critical part to the, uh, to the success of, of any kind of interface. I'm smashing Chris. Chris, um, it's it's two o'clock and we're actually um, sure. out of time. So um, I think um, we've got a, a couple of other questions, but perhaps we can try to take those offline and respond directly. I just sure. want to say a huge thank you to you for such an informative and useful presentation. Um, great content and um, thought-provoking content. And also a huge thank you to everybody who's attended. And indeed, yes, we'll um, make sure that the recording of this session is made available also for people who want to perhaps look again at it and um, delve a little bit deeper into some of the um, things you, you've, you've covered today. So thank you very much to all. Wish you all a good day. Okay. Thank you.